Okay, so let's continue about so people say this is the future. I think it's the present. More and more we're uh, going in really in such a fast way that even the scientific outcomes go beyond regulations. And it's my honor to talk to you about translational medicine and personalized medicine. Why? Because once I was talking with my kids, and it's amazing how they're, they belong to a generation in which they talk about mobile phones like a normal life. When I was born, there was only one telephone in the house that everybody answered. So you assume that if your daddy was answered the phone at home, he was at home. Not any longer like this. Can be anywhere, any place of the world. I can answer maybe my phone, not be at home. For them is, daddy, how are you there? It would be boring just to be waiting for a call at home before to leave. For them is like normal. So, internet changed our lives forever. We wouldn't be back again like those times, but the same would stand for nanotechnology. And you will see why I'm trying to explain you why nanotech will change even surgery procedures, cancer treatment, infection disease treatment, and for other issues that people think only about health, but let me tell you that Mercedes-Benz is developing a car that you scratch and they refurbish automatically with a painter. You have now ties with nanotechnology in which you have the spot and you can easily take it out and you can change the colors of your clothes. You will have smart, I don't like that smart uh, name of it, but in which you can warm up change the color of your clothes, and many um, uh, believable things that you might see in the years to come, more and more. Why? Because that's the way it works. And in terms of our nanotechnology, maybe I will focus on infection diseases. And sorry for some Spanish words, is that I want you to learn Spanish as well at the same time. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we have some scientific advances and clinical applications. Uh, even though we have high tech, we should never ever miss the relationship with the patient, to be in contact. We talk with them, talk them up, and really have that uh, relationship with them. But now we have different things coming up. We have big data. We have data mining. We have a connection in which we can have, in real time, 3D images. I have seen, for example, already in Holland, in which we have an ecography, 3D ecography room. It's a dark room. And you can have like a big cube in which you can modulate and change the pattern of the image and see the smallest ever image in terms of hurt, uh, abnormalities, and you can even prevent and have a treatment intra uterus. It's really wonderful. So more and more we will have those realities. So we have big data in genomics now. Why? Because we have new data streams, better analytic tools, more rapid uh, technology development, and need to personalize healthcare. What it means? That we have drugs tailored to the patients that are really targeting according to the genome expression of the person. And also we'll have imaging that can be tracking molecular level. We're talking about, for the very first time, have you ever listened about the, the cycle, biochemical cycle, in which we have the Krebs cycle, 
Yes. I have seen it in biology, in chemistry, and medicine. I already forget it about it. Because so big, too much factors and stuff. But now they're now tracking every step and factor with uh, labeling nanotechnological codes that can track every biochemical process. Please come in. You can see. It. Are there any places over there? Yeah, oh. plenty. Sorry. We can call it 20 more. Okay, so now we have translation of medicine. It works in two ways. What is that about translational medicine? It can go from the patient to the lab or from the lab to the patients. Meaning that, you know, when we learn medicine, for example, they say you need to integrate knowledge. But we never do it. Why? Because we see biochemistry here, then pathology, then we see histology and some other issues. But when we come to the patient, the patient never asks you, have you been in the class about the pathology tissues? No, you need to integrate there with the patient all your knowledge at once. And that's what counts for translational medicine. And more and more, it's much more difficult. I invite you to figure out a picture in which I have a patient with genome analysis. And you are an internal medicine doctor. And somebody can say, it has a G4, uh, D4, G pattern. What it means. And on top of that, you need to be aware of if you don't prescribe according to that genome expression, you may be sued because the health system says, how oh, then you don't know about the genome analysis? So we have plenty of knowledge that we cannot manage alone. So we may have the teams that work together in which we have genome analysis, biochemical analysis, and many readings integrated in the computer, trying to give you which is the best and most efficient way to treat in a personalized way this patient. And that's what we talk about through the translational medicine. But for translational medicine, we need to do also a change in education, as I mentioned before, because we need to be able to translate each other, to talk from the psychological point of view, from the physiological point of view, from the clinical point of view, from the pharmacological point of view, all together integrated in the patients. So we have also new technologies and we have biomarkers. Now we can really address situations because you can have a biomarker that works properly maybe in Europe, but not in Latin America because we're different. So how there you say the test that doesn't work for some regions and some other? Because we need to go deep into every person genome expression. Let me tell you that nowadays, according to studies, 30% of genetic factors stand for expression of the disease. 70% are epigenetics. What is epigenetics about? It's about the weather, it's about the food, it's about the stressful situation in the work or even the studies. And we know it from, for example, a piece of evidence. When we have a final test and we have a nervous virus somewhere here, what it means? You're stressful. In a stressful situation, your immune system goes down and the virus is spreads. So, now we have several factors coming together and we need to have these biomarkers. But the more we study, the more complex it became because it's that situation that you need to have the whole picture of each of us to understand where or not to be determinant of the uh, disease. Let me tell you, most of the study has been performed in twins in which you demonstrate that even though you have, for example, the gene to express a cancer, whatever type of cancer, 
is not enough to express that cancer. You need to have to be maybe smoker or drug abuser or whatever other factor. And maybe at that very moment you can have the difference. So we may see that uh, more and more we will be concentrating in that new technology. That smart guy, already dead, said in 1950, like in the conference room, there is plenty of space deep in the conference room. Nobody understood what he was talking about. He was saying that we had plenty of activity in really lower scale of physics than before. So later on, we realized that there is another technology that we can define it as a science in which engineering, analyzing and production of materials at the scale of 1 to 100 nanometers. But we need to figure out what is that scale about. First of all, we're, it's not a creative thing from human beings. It's already nature in which you have atomic, one atom, and for example, DNA size is one nanometer. We have proteins, 10 nanometers. We have virus. These are the most amazing. To me, it's really the smart way that uh, a leaf organism works. They don't need nucleus. They don't have sometimes uh, machinery for genetic replication. They use our machinery. Great, very smart. And they are smaller than every other life uh, way. Uh, burning in mind that there are other molecules that seem to be still kind of a lab uh, form. Okay, so I will invite you to Colombia. Let me tell you that we have a beautiful places like in here, like any part of the world, and I will show you and take advantage of this landscape to show you what is that nanoscale about. So you figure out it, this is not a contamination, sorry. It's an algae with this color, red colors and green colors. It's a beautiful place. And you may have a square in here where we're going deep inside of it until we get the nanotech level. Okay? Can you follow me up? Okay. Then, great, we have a butterfly there. And just a part of the wind of the butterfly will concentrate on it. There you have. We are already at a scale of 0.104 millimeters in an optical microscope. Then we have the smaller and deeper. And then we got one micrometer, still so big. It's changing a lot, the landscape, isn't it? Then we have 500 nanometers and have to look how it looks like. And then you have two nanometers. That is the spectroscopy of the atoms that are components of these molecules later on. So it seems like the landscape from the very beginning, isn't it? Yes, the colors of it seems to fit together. So when I was in the chemistry career, I figure out how dare they made formulas. It's a mathematical way to, a schematic way to figure out how structures are. No, they are through. So this is the structure of Cooper atoms, in which you can see through a tunnel scan microscopy the structure. And this is silicium particles, very rhythmic and geometrical ones. This is the nanometers scale level. Beautiful. This is not an artist painter. This is a real fact in which we have an ferrum atoms surrounded another Cooper atom. So we never figure out that these pictures could exist. And that's what we can discover with nanometer microscope. But once again, we came back to our life reality. And the smartest ones, the virus, already have that pattern. So let me tell you why we didn't discover before that. 
because he's like a kid with a toy. In the year of 1950, there were already viral diseases. They stand for thousand years, but nobody knew, and they couldn't understand why there was something alive in there, and nobody could see it, even though we already talk about bacteria and some other microorganisms. Why? Because we didn't have the toy to watch out that size. Once we got it, then we have, for example, tobacco virus, that shape, that is like a carbon nanotube, and here you have an example of nowadays nanoparticles, quantum dots, liposomes, golden nanoparticles, carbons, nanotubes, and so on and so on, nanoshields. You can have an infinity and more and more different shapes of nanoparticles. And then we come up with something that triggered and challenge your imagination. What we know about the physics is the 3D dimensions. One, large, wide, and high, isn't it? But who knows about B-dimensional physics? It's difficult because the behave of the particles at that level is different. So they can have different properties I will, wouldn't go so deep on it, but we have uh, thermal properties, we have magnetic properties, we have optical properties and electric properties. The mass of them are also changing at the nanoscale. So, let's see it in a practical way. Please remember that colors. So you have a golden nanoparticle, when you have a 25 nanometers, it's red. When you have 50 nanometers, it's green. And when you have 100 nanometers, it's like an orange. And the same stands for silver. So you have like a different spectrum. But great, you know? We are in the one of the oldest cities in Europe. And we have, I have seen yesterday some pictures about artists. The artists knew about some metal colors and they used them in the churches, like you have seen in some cathedrals, in which even though they didn't know about nanotech, they used them and they have those colors that stand still after 100 years. Great, isn't it? So we have different type of properties. I wouldn't bore you with this uh, physics, but it's just to say that you can decorate nanoparticles the way you wish. Why? You can, for example, add polymers, small molecules, nucleic acids, proteins, antibodies, surface chains, surface functionalities, and so on and so on. So whenever we go to the lab, we need to purify proteins and stuff like this. That is really very old technology for nature. You can have, for example, in the surface of a cell, five simultaneous reactions on the top in only a few nanometers distance without mixture, without contamination. How there? Amazing, isn't it? And that's what now the knowledge is trying to catch up to control and do an engineering at nanotechnology level. So we can also functionalize nanoparticles in which we can uh, decorate it with peptides, with fluorescent substance, with whatever signaling, and more and more we can do it more functional. Great until there, but what is the application? So, in USA, they realized that it will change forever communications. Computer, now we will have a really quantum computers with through nanotechnology, and they will change the space research, but also the medicine. So, they did a national call that they call uh, the Nanotechnology Initiative. And they say, okay, the genome sequence 
it's much more efficient uh, when you use automatized process. Then they need to focus this also in health applications. And they want to look at this, for example, create new formulations and in pathways of drug administrations able to wider the therapeutic potential of these new nanodrugs. So, now we can use nanotechnology in several ways. This is a part of the chapter that I wrote with some colleagues, and this is uh, available also in English, sorry, because they, I put some slides in Spanish. And we can have also the nanotechnology that now we call nanomedicine, that is focused on prevention, diagnosis, treatment, monitoring, and controlling of diseases. We can have, for example, a blood sample in which even without withdrawing the blood from the patient, we will have tests for the patient. And the main goal is to integrate those technologies all together. You know, now there is a new discipline of medicine called teragnostic. Teragnostic means to join at once. And I will give you an example with, from my reading. Imagine that this is a nanoparticle that I can decorate with a receptor. So at the end of the day, I will have ligand-receptor interaction in which, for example, antineoplastic drug will come only to the tumor antigen in which the neoplastic cells are harboring this uh, receptor. Once they attach there, since they are small enough, they are able to come inside of the cytoplasmatic area of the cell and leave the delivery of drug inside of the cell. That's what we call intracellular treatment. Amazing. For the very first time, we're close to have zero chemotherapy side effects. Because we know that when we have uh, antineoplastic chemotherapy, we're poisoning the patient in some way. Now, you can trigger this. But we can even go beyond, and let me tell you that there are already ongoing developments on that technology, where you, when you arrive to the ligand interaction receptor, you have the same level. So this is the first part, the diagnose, and then the treatment, that is called teratinosis. So with the same molecule, you perform diagnose and treatment. Amazing, isn't it? Then we can use it for diagnose. Then we have the nanoparticles used for microbial, as I will talk about it. Then we can use it as an anti antimicrobial treatment. For example, from the ancient times, the, and I remember my mom used to do it. Whenever you fall down from your bike, they put sometimes mercurium, even though it was toxic. We call it in Spanish mercurium. It's a red solution that they put and you heal quite good. Great. They didn't know that it was mercurium with antimicrobial activity. You wouldn't contaminate that tissue. But now, the same stamp for silver. And you will see how we can use it later. But also we can have nano vaccines, meaning that we can. Uh, there was somebody. Ah, you, sorry, to signal you that we can develop new adjuvants and new vaccines that can stimulate the immune system and modulate it only for a single purpose, maybe to kill. Uh, uh, tumor cells, because before vaccine was designed to prevent, now it's to treat as well. Uh, or we can use it to kill, for example, herpes virus, that is intracellular. So for the very first time, we're facing the possibility of to treat, to treat herpes virus intracellularly. So you might be cured in a year to come with antiretroviral therapy. 
but there are some other uh, treatments. For example, in Switzerland, there's a study which they use it as a thermal treatment for cancer. How they did? They inject the metal nanoparticles into the tumor uh, lesion, and then they use ultrasound. Then they shake it up in such a way that they heat up the nanoparticles from 37 degrees till 500 degrees in a nanosecond. So the patient even doesn't feel at all pain or whatever. But you know what happened with the DNA from these small cells? It's rusted. It's over. So you can kill at once. So now uh, we're trying to develop our research in uh, surgery uh, specialties to perform intrachirurgical nano treatments. You see? So if you envision how it's going to happen, cancer wouldn't be in the next 20 years a death penalty for a patient. It's going to be like chronic as diabetes, hypertension, and so on and so on. So, of course, that is ideal because anyhow we have all the issues. Can you imagine that if we live 120 years, you are retired at the age of 65, what are you going to do after that all the time doing things? then we will come with some mental disorders because we don't know what to do with our lives because we've been working hard, giving lectures and stuff like this, and so on. And, of course, we can also give the delivery of antibiotics and we can have simultaneous drugs interactions as well that now we use it for, for example, decorating prosthesis. I will show you up later on. And of course, we have the teratinoxid approach, and we will have diagnosis and treatment at the same time. So, as I mentioned uh, in nature, you know what is that about? It's a pili. It's a pili, and to me, it was amazing when the Japanese team, after 20 years' work, they uh, developed the mechanism of rotation of the pili. At the end of the day, it's an engine, isn't it? It's moving now, it's rotating, it's like an engine. And uh, the Nobel Prize, last Nobel Prize for chemistry, they demonstrate that there's a molecule that they already put to rotate. So, in, uh, engines from nanomolecular level are starting to be a reality as well. That's the Nobel Prize in chemistry. So, we might have also whatever surface decoration with also functional activity. Then you say, okay, great, you're talking about science fiction, but we came to talk about reality. No, I'm talking about reality. Look, this is a microfluid essay that we call lab in a ship. Can you imagine that we can go to a forest and have a small issue and device that we can diagnose ourselves? Never, huh? We can have it. We can have also, now say it's based on nanoparticles, like golden nanoparticles that with the magnetic properties, or silicon, or quantum dots. Now there's another approach, and in fact I'm working with it. Have you ever listened about nano water? No, maybe not. Too much silence? Yes, nanowater is very simple. If you play out with magnetic fields, it happens that you can collect oxygen like in the grapes. Oxygen around the hydrogen uh, skeleton, and you will have like a much more concentrated oxygen into the same water without any chemical modification. It's called nanowater. And now it's able to kill bacteria. I have an amazing essay with an American company that produced that, and they show up how it's able to kill bacteria, and I will tell you what are the mechanisms of it. Then we have other, for example, we can have functional resonance. You know that nowadays, before, we have like a picture of something that we were even skeptical, uh, a Rex tag, now we have SPECT, and so on. 
but nowadays we have functional imaging. For example, we can track whether or not a brain tumor is once again growing up. Why? Through collagen stress activity. And we can target through a software into the resonance team. And we have also nanomaterials with the dimensions and different derivatives that we can use even uh, to produce these devices. So this is a lab on the ship. You figure out that before it used to be like uh, facilities for a lab, but now it's at nanoscale level in which I brought this stuff. I wouldn't talk about the company because I don't care about the company, but it's just to show you up that is a reality. They already have available in the market tests that never we figure out could be that fast, sensitive, specific, and efficient for this diagnosis. This is ship with a nanotech in which you can have different species characterization. So for example, with the conventional methods, you stand for two to four days waiting for the results. Now, with this, you can have 2.5 hours. That makes a huge difference when you are in intensive care units. And you need the name of the fungal, for example, microorganism. Why? Because you need to give the molecular approach with the antifungal or antibiotic treatment. So let me tell you that you can have this also uh, for bacteria as well, and you can even perform anti uh, or susceptibility tests for antibiotics, let's say. You can have also antimicrobial nanoparticles, like the metal ones from silver, or metallic oxide, or carbon, or those ones based on peptides that can kill bacteria as well. You can also have nano vaccines, and you can also give antiretroviral or even antibiotic drugs. But which are the mechanisms? And that's also one of the hopeful uh, issues for medicine. We have a lot of resistance, bacterial resistance, and now we have super bugs. The mechanism of uh, working of these uh, particular nanoparticles are simultaneous and they are functional in that they produce the eruption of the cell membrane, they destroy proteins, simultaneously they damage the DNA, they re release some uh, ions, they produce reactive oxygen species and they stop the transportation of transmembrane electrodes, all at once. It means that, at least for some time, there wouldn't be a way for the bacteria to escape. So what they have demonstrated is that the, there's no resistant mechanism against these nanoparticles. Why? Because it's really blasting the cell, the bacterial cell, for example. It's great, because that will help us to solve those resistance. So here you have a list, I wouldn't go deep on it, just to show you how that these are nanomaterials, and this is the mechanism of action, and this is the clinical use. For example, now we have devices in which you can have some tissues decorated with this, and you once they became infected with bacteria, they turn the colors. So let's say that they are white, and now it turns red, so you realize that the tissue is infected. But once it's infected, what happens? They release antibiotics on the topics. You have also uh, topic uh, treatments and so on. You have other uh, mechanisms like uh, intracellular mechanism. You have also, as I mentioned, phototherapy that stands for infection but also for cancer and so on and so on we have really different methods but as I mentioned I want always to see the science applied to the patient solution
not only for painters, because that is a good profit to publish a paper always, but what about the patients? They are waiting us for solutions. So, for example, you have Staphylococcus aureus in which they produce a film, and now you can use spiral superparamagnetic ion oxide nanoparticles with recover with carboxyl, in which you have uh, some biochemical properties. This is the size, 10 to 20 nanometers. This is the doses uh, prescribed, and this is the action mechanism. And these are some. It doesn't affect the cell addition in mammal cells. And we have different sizes as well. The doses, um, once again, say, great. That is the ideal solution. No, there's always, as in science, we have one solution and 10 equations. Maybe you can control it. But for the very first time, we're trying to develop toxicity tests. Why? Because now there are some devices that come with silver releasing. But silver is toxic, depending upon the amount of silver that we're talking about. And it's a pro-inflammatory component against the immune system. And on top of that can change, for example, the coagulation cascade as well. So we need to perform toxicity tests for those particles. And also, as I mentioned, we can use it as a vaccine. Why? Because we improve the penetration into the tissues, the access to lymphatic nodes and the vessels. We have uh, positive effects. We can modulate how long they stand circulating and how they're going to be released. But once again, we have another trouble. People from the ecological point of view saying, OK, now you're going to contaminate with secretion of nanoparticles the whole world. You need to have like an ecological way to recycle in particles, okay? Another way to <coughs> to start up uh, and study this position with the, you can trigger the immune system with the same antigen several times until the until get immune response. You can perform cross antigen presentation. You can use as a specific adjuvants. We have a trouble with adjuvants nowadays with vaccines that there are some of them uh, toxic. Now we wouldn't have that troubles. And of course we have like a uh, medical student straight vaccines. Then we can have also like a uh, triggering the immune system in a passive way, like we do it with, uh, uh, like a mom doing with, through the, uh, passing by the antibodies to the little kids, we can also give a temporal immune response for the patients, or you can even trigger the memory cells as well with nanoparticles. And these are part of the studies and some that are already on the market. For example, you have here the Diagnose T2 Candida. It's a device. This, sorry, is the name of the company because I want to show you how that is a reality. It's not because I don't have any conflict interest at all. So these are the composition. For example, now we know about liposomal amphotericin B that is less toxic than the normal uh, amphotericin B. The use or of this and what is the state of our, of it already in the market? These are the clinical studies. Market, 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 uh, phase three studies, market, and so on, so on. It's just to show you up that in diagnosis, in therapeutic approach, and medical devices are already a reality. But I aware about some live information. For example, in Colombia, they have a publicity on TV saying. You have a nice shampoo with nanoparticles. It's going to be a beauty pair and so on. And I say, that's not true. If they use nanoparticles, you will poison your brain because that small may goes into even the uh, bone tissue and goes into the cells. 
is because they are pretending to be high tech. And once they go through, because uh, they, they play between natural and what they call master formals and stuff like this, so be aware, it's not true. But we have really, I will go fast to these medical devices. For example, nowadays we have on the market these polycatheters or tracheal or CBC catheters. What they have is a nanoparticle film, thinner than ever. It's like the amount of silver, golden, and palladium nanoparticles is equivalent like to fill a uh, soccer field with only one atom of them. It's thinner, you, you wouldn't see it of course, but what is great is that inside of it and outside you have a bacteria. And what happened with our catheters? They are great just to bind the bacteria and produce biofilms. In the biofilm, they pile up the bacteria, and once we treat with antibiotics, the, the one from the bottom, they wouldn't reach antibiotic treatment. They became resistant, and on top of that, they contaminate the patient. So we are always aware about the infections with catheters that we call actually health care infections due to medical devices. Now with this technology, bacteria cannot attach to that surface. Why? Because there is an electric field that would have led them to feed. So they cannot create like a number of population and biofilms. And what is the difference in terms of practical clinical issues? You can last with a catheter for five to ten days and you're very scared about it. But with this one, you can use it for 90 days without any contamination. Great. Why? Because first we lower the morbidity, the mortality, the use of very expensive antibiotics. And uh, also we have more cost efficient use of medical devices. In the case of CVC, I mean, uh, cathedral, central venous cathedral, it can lower the infection by 90%. Can you imagine? And as long as they cannot grow up in there easily, the resistance also drops down. And of course, now we come up with, for example, prothesis that are recovering, and they are still trying to develop that in which you wouldn't have contamination with your processes. So it's a great approach. This is a way to explain that this is a normal situation of biofilm production and this is the way that you can decorate those uh, devices. Of course, there are devices that release are, uh, uh, silver, but once I told you they can kill bacteria and it's even the worst because they produce several toxins once they be killed and they get inflammation. With those nano uh, components, you have this electronic effect that the bacteria would feed on the surface and this is the way it could be the picture with the microscope. And this is a test in which you have a silicon normal uh, device in which you don't have recovers, nanotech recover. And here you see the difference with one with the nanotech. It's far different. So we have really applied solutions from the nanotech of field to our protection diseases. And here is another very curious slide that I've seen. This is a non-coded surface. Look at the red blue cells, I mean the blood, attached to that glass. Once you have nanotech, it goes straight because it couldn't fit. Amazing, isn't it? And that's really the edge of QNA technology in which you will have sensitivity, in which you can wear gloves, it touches the patient, and you can perform several tests in real time. Impressive, isn't it?
and you capture the information, go to the data mining, and you read out. So it's still uh, under development, this narrative. So in summary, I can tell you that translational medicine will end up in the personalized medicine, will help us to prevent to have better treatment in a high complex uh, allocation and of course we need uh, to improve how the prices goes on because it's as usual. Now we have those mobile phones are some of them cheap but the big, the very very first one, I don't know whether or not you you see your parents with a big box that they, they can even defend with this because it was so big, it costs a lot of money now. It's affordable for everybody. Even in the countryside, you have a, a mobile phone. So the more technology is developed, more massive developed, the better improvement in price as well. And I think it's very important for uh, being applied. So at last, I want to say just this word that I reflects is the knowledge benefit, scientific knowledge benefit applied to health trouble solution from patients should be our main goal. Thank you for having me.
they came to the hospital. So the team in the Karolinska Institute, where I perform my postdoc in nanotechnology of life medicine, they are they built up a hospital that has been funded last July, and they say, okay, why you are getting smaller and smaller hospital? You need to enlarge it. Say no, because whenever you have hospital means that. Patient need to be hospitalized means that it may be already an advanced situation. We want to go to prevent diseases. So we we need to have less four level complex facilities, more preventive first level issues. With technology, we will be able to perform a chip on the lab test. <coughs> Let's say you're going to a farm and check out the family for genes, for uh, whatever level of hemoglobin or so on, so on, without even goes to a town. So we can prevent, and that's, uh, at the end of the day, that is for medicine the ideal situation, because it's not to treat patients, it's to prevent the patient to be uh, sick. And if we do this, we are really in the right way of technology use as you might think about it. So do you have any other questions? Yeah. Professor Senior. Uh, you have you have spoken briefly about the toxicity of this nanoparticles. I was uh, thinking about their application for tumors, not for the liver drugs uh, to in a target or mm -hmm. So what about the possibility of this toxicity in a patient? Because uh, these nanoparticles are made in metals, you know, uh, silver, uh, gold, uh, carbon, uh, fibers. Well, actually, that depends upon the nanoparticle size. We know that, for example, the average size should be between 100 and 150 nanometers. If you have nanoparticles that, uh, with a size of 50 nanometers, it can go into the nucleus and perform uh, also mutations. So it's a matter of playing between and so on. But uh, we still far to develop the, the best toxicity test. And now, even FDA and European uh, FDA, they are really having a difficulties to how to control them out. Why? Because if, if you are the FDA, you need to have high qualified people to perform those tests. It's not whatever clinical test. You need to be a really high tech test. So they need to have facilities, expertise, and so on in the field. They don't have it. So I would just give an anecdotic issue. I went to talk about nanotechnology to my FDA uh, institution in Colombia. And they were saying, what are you talking about? They didn't know even about nanotech already commercialized. So saying, how there? So what are you judging? How are you doing that? stringency process. No way. We need to wait until they develop best toxicity test. And uh, in some cases we need also to to see how far we can go as he said, for example, for genetic tests. You know that now we have before in two thousand four the price of the genome was about uh, two thousand dollars. You know where's the price nowadays? $75. And I'm sure that in five years it's going to be like $10. So, more and more, we know more about the people, but it's scary sometimes when you know about too much and you can't control it. That's true. But that depends upon our institutional health system uh, studies. And that, that we need also to demonstrate what we need money to perform studies as well about toxicity or so
further down the line, when these uh, technologies are more available, what do you think that means for medical doctors who have professional medical diagnosis and self-diagnosis are um, less about human expertise as they are data interpretation, which in theory could be done by a program or AI? That's an excellent question. There is a book uh, from the Swedish man say dot com health and he's talking about something like he figure out that in the future and they say for example you go to the toilet in which you have sensors and with urine test you don't need to go to a lab test so you're just pissing in there and you have the sensitivity and goes straight to intelligence <coughs> system and they test whether or not you have whatever substances. But what I'm really uh, thinking about is that there are many things that are going to change. For example, for good, surgery. Now there's a possibility, now close, but in the next 30 years that you will have nanobots, <coughs> meaning that you can inject a nanobot, goes to whatever place, and perform uh, genetic engineering modification and restore the original mutations, for example. That's amazing. And then people will say, oh, what about surgery? Could be over. But we should not be scared about it. It's for the good, because maybe we have time to think about something else instead of being itching or doing something like this. And in terms of orthopedics, for example, if you figure out a bone is a crystal calcium component, if you are able to rebuild it in such a physiochemical way, then you, you're being able to refurnish the bone, not like before, because if you put a, a nanotech microscope the fracture will be something like this, and that's the reason why we have electric turbulences that make pain when it's cold, and we have electromagnetic uh, alterations into the bone. But if you can once connect, like normal crystal, it's perfect. Now, for example, another approach being for deaf, deaf people. They create a sensor that they are able, for the very first time, deaf people to listen. And now, also, there are like an optical wires. There's one experiment in which they demonstrate that a man that has been blind since the very beginning, since they were born, they were able to have like a sensitivity for light. So it, it would transform our way of treating patients, of course. But then, as I mentioned, it will challenge us with maybe mental disorders will be because uh, people will be boring for doing nothing. I, I don't know, I think it's very difficult to to figure out, but I'm always positive about uh, because when you see that you have a solution, but it's just a matter of economical afford. Uh, I, I will give you one example. So we have an immune therapy for cancer. Uh, uh, one of the guys here asking me about it. And we treat the patient, 27 years old. You know that cancer is all about the immune system recognition of uh, neoplastic cells. So there was uh, an approach in which, in which the tumor cells from the patient was taken out. They were uh, optimized, it means put it like in a recognized way to, for the immune system and put it back to the patient. And then they mix it up with uh, cells from tumor process from another patient. You know that when you perform allograft, the idea would be to have this compatibility. But then with this, the ideal situation would be the opposite, to reject. And they perform this. I use it with one patient that is a 27 years old man. He has a death penalty because there was no way he had been already removed the tumor, performed uh, chemotherapy with uh, uh, 
thebosolamide and then radiotherapy and one lower he has the thermal growth up. So we put that vaccine and now he's the youngest ever in the world person with apparently a whole a cure of the cells because he's already five years old. Five years ago, sorry, that happened. And a month ago, I called the patient and say, how are you doing? I say, perfect. My last resonance, zero tumor. I already, he was just married when he got with the cancer. Now he has a two year old kid. Whenever he never thought gonna be a daddy. So it's amazing how science and these technologies can improve our life quality. And I think that if you do it at least for one patient, to me, that counts a lot. Because otherwise, it wouldn't be a sense just for fun uh, to be in the lab trying to create solutions. Okay, thank you very much. For being here.